the research that I do is really tied to my kids in some way and that I care a lot about the sustainability of our environment and having clean water and a beautiful world to live in and for them to live in. And so um, that underlies a lot of the passion that I have for sustaining coastal ecosystems. So um, you guys live along the coast and so maybe this introduction to, to the coastal environment is, is just you live and breathe it every single day. Um, but I'm drawn to studying coastal ecosystems um, not only because of their aesthetic beauty um, and my childhood memories of going to the coast and, and enjoying recreating on the beach, uh, but also because of their incredible value. Um, more than 40% of the global human population lives within 50 miles of the coastline. We live in these coastal zones um, because they're historically highly productive environments um, where we have access and, um, to clean water, um, and, and productive fisheries, and a lot of that's being generated by these ecosystems that you see here, the constellation of co coastal ecosystems um, that are along the coast, and it's their historic provisioning of ecosystem services that have really kind of linked humans to the coastal environment for a long time. And we value them um, in, the, in the modern age because of their ability to clean our water, to mitigate coastal flooding, these storm surges during hurricanes. These are our first line of coastal defense. Um, but they're really valuable in terms of supporting biodiversity, fisheries, recreation, and all of our sort of cultural identity as coastal res residents, right? Um, but this long history of humans in the coast has led to um, a lot of human activities in the coastal zone. And so we've used coastal environments for everything from boating and commerce to, to harvesting um, shellfish and fish uh, to sport our sort of protein in our, in our diets. Um, but we've been out agricult uh, driving agricultural in, in these environments as well. So if you um, spend any time in the Mediterranean, you'll see that salt marshes have been converted, uh, converted into rice fields. Um, or if you go to northern Europe, much of those coastal wetlands are now being grazed by livestock, and they have been for hundreds of years. Um, but we've also developed over our coastlines. Uh, so this is a picture of Boston in 1777, and what's in black here is what was salt marsh. Um, and in what's in gray is, was historic urban development. And now you can see the footprint of, of Boston in 1999, and you can see all that salt marsh. That's the footprint of the city of Boston. And so we've simply built over these environments um, as a function of our, our you know, desire to be close to productive fisheries and, and to be able to you know, have productive commerce as well. Um, and so this is a major collision of these ecosystems that we care about um, and our desire to extract ecosystem services. Um, but not only are coastal zones sort of imperiled by these threats um, from our simply human occupation of the coast, um, but they're also ground zero for climate change. Uh, so this is everything from sea level rise, kind of slowly, or, or however you perceive of it on whatever time scale, rapidly um, encroaching on the coastal zone and reshaping um, our coastal environment, um, but also increased storminess and, and stronger and, and more severe and more uh, um, frequent uh, in, in storms. Um, and those are wiping away our coastal ecosystems. Um, and other sort of more subtle, uh, some seemingly subtle effects of things like altered precipitation. So these are just some of the dimensions of climate change that are colliding on our coastal ecosystems. And not surprisingly, because of climate change and human activity, um, between 19 and 85 percent of coastal habitat has been lost or severely degraded in the last century. So we're, we're sort of at the, the scraps of the coastal zone um, that's even left now. So what I perceive as our challenge as scientists and also in society is to preserve and restore the natural systems on the coast that still exist, as, in, as well as their services, um, in the face of these overlapping stressors. So how do we preserve these systems? Um, and so what this requires from a scientific perspective is fundamental knowledge of the mechanisms that control the resilience, the natural resilience of these ecosystems. What controls when and where that we lose a little or a lot of them? And what are the mechanisms that control whether they come back a little bit or a lot? We need to understand those kind of those rules that, that control uh, natural resilience of these systems. 
And then we have to integrate that kind of knowledge of the natural history of these environments into how we do restoration. We have a long history of sort of engineering over the coastline, and there's all these unanticipated consequences of that. And so the real goal of my research program is to do these two things, is to use our inspiration from how natural ecosystems um, self-assemble after um, disturbance events and understanding the resilience, and then use that to inform restoration design. And so today, I'm going to talk a lot about this second part um, with this hopeful message of what we can do about coastal restoration um, sort of as a, as a society and, and where we need to go with, um, with our research. So today, I'm going to talk about three uh, vignettes. Uh, the first is uh, taking us to coastal dunes. And I'll be asking and, and attempting to get closer to an answer of how can we optimize the success of coastal dune restoration. And I'll be presenting some research from coastal Georgia on this topic. Um, and then working right in your backyard on the intercoastal waterway, I'm going to be talking about how we might better enhance the coexistence of boats uh, in the coastal environment and, and our abilities to sustain um, coastal salt marshes and oyster reefs in the light of this kind of increased traffic um, that our estuaries are experiencing. And finally, I'm going to give you some perspective um, do it from a synthesis I did with one of my graduate students on how far we've come in restoring oyster reefs across the eastern U.S. So of all the effort that's been done to restore oyster reefs in, over the last 50 years, how much progress have we made? So let's get started. I'm going to take you um, just across the road to the sand dunes. Um, so these environments, just like other coastal ecosystems, are hotspots for ecosystem services. Um, they're providing really valuable coastal property protection. They're that first line of defense when hurricanes come and hit the coastline, right? The sand dunes are there uh, to dissipate that storm surge and absorb some of those storm impacts. Um, but in this region, they're also extremely valuable for tourism um, and the cultural identity of people who come and walk the beaches. You come there not just to watch on the sandy beaches, but to look at the sort of the array of the dunes that are there as well and enjoy the wildlife that's utilizing them. And they're also really important places for endangered species. Um, so we have the St. Augustine beach mouse, and that's totally dependent on, the vib uh, on how vibrant um, coastal sand dune habitats are. Um, but you may also be familiar with some of the shorebirds that utilize uh, sand dunes for, for nesting, as well as sea turtles that also uh, lay their eggs in these, uh, on the fore dunes of these habitats. Um, but they're also hot spots for nutrient cycling. This is the interface of the land and the sea in the beach zone. There's lots of sort of um, uh, complex biogeochemical cycling happening in this dynamic interface, and um, that is also important for sort of uh, in an ecosystem service protect, uh, sort of perspective. Um, and some of the key threats to sort of dunes, um, this is Daytona Beach, <laughs> and uh, there's much of the core Florida coastline looks just like this. There's hardly any dune habitat, or there's no dune habitat left, simply because we built beach, our buildings right up to the dunes. And um, there's, we simply have just driven the habitat to extinction. Um, but we're also seeing a lot of storm-driven erosion. There's an interaction between this kind of coastal squeeze. We've squeezed this habitat out, and then our roads and our bridges um, that you see here, you know, this is Flagler Beach. Probably you guys are familiar with this as well. Um, but we're losing this habitat partly because there's no natural resilience built into the system anymore because we have roads and bridges and infrastructure there. All right, so not surprisingly, around the world, coastal erosioning is threatening more than 70% of beach habitat globally, and that's a somewhat outdated number, but I struggled to find a better one uh, for the talk tonight. So not surprisingly, these are an area out of sort of um, uh, effort to restore and protect coastal properties that we're trying to get out there and restore coastal dunes in whatever way we can. So whether that's putting up sand capture fences um, to rebuild this breachway that got breached during this hurricane event in, in Massachusetts, um, or we're simply building whole dunes, um, and even homeowners, this is a picture from New Smyrna Beach, this is a property owner after Hurricane Matthew who went out with palm fronds and a couple of transplants they found at the local nursery and are trying to restore the, the dunes in front of their house because they realize how valuable they are for protecting their property for to the next storm event. And so we're seeing this kind of, it's a, it's a bit of a mosaic of different types of effort. Um, to try to get the, maintain um, these habitats where they um, either are, are being degraded or we want to get them sort of restored in, in a new location uh, to, to gain their ecosystem service benefits. 
Now, historically, the way that a coastal dune restoration typically happens, this is probably somewhat of a familiar sight to you, it looks something like this. We have this very orderly arrangement of transplants on the landscape, um, and the transplants are purposefully distributed. So these are some of the, the main... Um, dune building plants. Um, this is sea oats in this, in this uh, particular picture. But the idea behind arranging these transplants in this kind of um, dispersed array is to minimize competition among the transplants. The idea is that you'll get the most plant growth if you sp simply spread them out on the landscape. And this comes from sort of uh, our historic perspective on, on cultivating trees in the terrestrial environment. You spread them out, the trees grow more, they have more light, they have more nutrients. Is that the case? Um, and if that's perceived to be the case in the coastal dune environment as well. And the other thing that's typically done is that we um, place these transplants on the fore dune, um, this sort of dune slope area of existing dunes to simply stabilize what's left. Um, or we simply build entire dunes um, from front to back with this very even array. So there's examples of this right up on A1A, um, right behind you here. So this is conventionally what's done. It's very easy to permit a dune restoration project with this type of approach. However, there's been some research that's come out from salt marshes and also from coral reefs that suggests that instead of dispersing your transplants in this kind of like arranged manner, but you clump them together, you can actually get better restoration outcomes. The plants are more likely to survive and they're also more likely to uh, laterally grow. And the reason for this is that they're facilitating one another. The transplants are getting to benefit from their neighbors if there's really um, uh, harsh physical conditions like lots of wave stress or really poor oxygen availability. If you're surrounded by lots of your neighbors, they start to help each other out. And so this can be really key when you want to restore an ecosystem and a habitat that's particularly stressful, like the worst places to do restoration. You want to give plants a buddy to get through the event, this sort of transplant event. So the question um, that I worked on with an undergraduate is, can we identify basically which of these planting strategies, if you disperse the plants or you simply clump them together, should be used when and where to improve coastal restoration outcomes? So I'm going to give you a brief ecology lesson um, before I get into sort of what we actually did for this experiment. So this is a, a, what's a theory in ecology called the stress gradient hypothesis. And what I'm going to orient you to the axes here. So on the x-axis, essentially imagine you're in an environment where you go from an area of relatively low physical stress, say low wind stress, to one of really high wind stress. All right? On the same axis, essentially consumers, grazers, or predators in that environment do not do well where, it's really high, where there's high physical stress. However, they tend to thrive where it's a relatively benign environment. So you tend to see these two sort of pressures um, uh, having an re inverse relationship with one another. Now on the y-axis, we have basically the increased frequency of positive interactions. So these are these facilitative interactions that I told you about, the benefits of being near your neighbors. They're increasing as you go up this axis. And conversely, the frequency of negative interactions or these competitive interactions are inversely related to, to this. Um, so it's either great to be around your buddies, and it really stinks to be sort of... Um, yeah, far, far away from them on this end of the axis. Or conversely, you don't need your buddies at all and you really want to be far away from them to minimize competition. So the stress gradient hypothesis predicts, this, we call it the, also the smiley face hypothesis. So if you leave with anything else, you learned about the smiley face hypothesis from ecology. All right, so, um, so at either where you have really high physical stress, predation is super high. You need lots of buddies to get through that really high predation pressure. In areas of relatively low physical and consumer pressure, you're competing with your buddies because it's not a very relatively un um, stressful environment. Um, and once again, when you're in really high physical, stressful conditions, you might need your buddies essentially around to, to, um, uh, to get through this, this stressful, these stressful conditions. So we decided to take this hypothesis and apply it to a, sort of a restoration application. So, stay with me here. All right, so we have the same axes here, but in, on the x-axis, but on the y-axis, what we're talking about is how successful is your restoration um, effort. And you might expect that essentially you want a strategy under low stressful conditions, low stress conditions, where you're minimizing competition. 
So low stress, that's when competition you know, should be really strong. You want a strategy where you might minimize competition. However, when you get to really highly stressful conditions, that's where you want to sort of change how you do restoration and clump clusters together to sort of, sort of basically neighbors can benefit from one another. So the question is, how might we tailor restoration strategies to these underlying local physical stress conditions? here. So can we just simply switch from strategy A to strategy B if you know where you are on a stress gradient? So there's two ways we might sort of modify the way that we do transplanting in the environment and, and sort of optimize restoration outcomes. And the first one is what I just talked about. So you can either disperse your transplants and that's where you're going to sort of minimize or you're going to minimize competition. That's a typo right there. Competition minimizing strategy. So you're far apart from your neighbors. However, as physical stress increases, you want to switch to clumping, right? So hypothetically, that's what we might expect to be sort of the best way to tailor strategies. However, we can also alter how, de how dense we, trans we um, plant plants in the environment. And again, you're going to have better benefits from your neighbors if you have lots of them in the, in in the environment. So essentially, you switch from being you know, low density, um, you, know, you want to have relatively few neighbors when there's low physical stress so that the individual transplants you put out can really laterally grow. They can optimize their acquisition of resources. However, you really want to pack a lot of transplants out in the environment when it's really uh, high physical stress. So here's the experiment. We cross those two factors, whether plants were, dis were clumped or dispersed um, in a d across a, a dune stress gradient. So we started this experiment um, after Hurricane Matthew had really reorganized dunes in coastal Georgia. So this is a dune profile. This is the beach over here. And this is what we're going to be calling the front line zone. And that's where you guys see all the rack kind of washed up on the beach, right? And there tends to be sand that kind of accumulates. And you see little seedlings of dune plants in this location. The slope here, this is where traditionally uh, restoration is done. And then here is the dune ridge and the dune swale. And these are areas that weren't sort of directly impacted by the storm. So we're going to focus on essentially our restoration in this kind of beachfront area. So we had um, 35 plots in each of these two zones, the front line and the slope. And the front line, importantly, this is actually a relatively low stress environment for a plant. Sand mobility is relatively low. That rack material, all that dead plant material that's accumulated on the beach, really kind of holds sand in place. So there's not much burial stress for transplants, a small little transplant that's put out in the environment. But there are also areas where all that rack material holds, soil, holds moisture, but it's also slowly breaking down over time. So that's a lot of water and nutrients that those plants might be bathed in. So you can imagine this is a low stress environment. So remember the stress gradient hypothesis and get a prediction in your head for which planting strategy you think is going to work. All right. And then we have here the, the slope, however, this is where sand is really moving up and down the beach. It's a really dynamic environment. You don't have a whole lot of soil moisture here. And there's also relatively low nutrient availability. There isn't that big pile of de decomposing rack that provides that kind of fertilizer for plants to grow. All right. So um, in these, and this just reiterates what these sort of different environments look like. So in these different zones, we had um, the following seven treatments where we had single transplants alone, sea oat transplants. You guys probably recognize sea oats. They're the ones that are really beautiful, and they tend to sort of really build up the dunes laterally, and they have these beautiful inflorescences. inflorescences. Um, and then we had basically our dispersed treatments at three different densities, um, four, nine, and 16 transplants. This is our traditional sort of restoration strategy right here. These were exactly mimicking what we typically do. And then we clustered the plants at the same densities. And we measured the success of this restoration project in a couple different ways. Number one, did the plants survive? Okay, did you get them through the first year of, of their life? Um, second, how well did they grow? So how many new leaves were produced over the course of the experiment? Um, we also wanted to look at what, how resilient these transplants were. So it's one thing to plop stuff out in the ground and hope that it survives and grows. It's another thing if the thing can withstand a major disturbance event. So we hacked off all the tops of the plants. We simulated a major disturbance event to the system. And we looked at how well the transplants regrew after this disturbance event. 
So you can imagine in coastal Georgia, there's big cows that roam around these barrier islands, and they'll sometimes chew off the whole top of one of these transplants. So imagine we simulated cow trampling. It could easily be in Georgia, um, you know, somebody stomping all over the dunes. Okay, <coughs> excuse me, in Florida. Um, and then we looked at how much sand was accumulated around these various treatments at the end of the experiment. So how well are they rebuilding the coastal dune habitat? So here's some of our results. So um, this is from the front line. So again, that's where there's all that deposit of rack. And here on the x-axis, this is how long we are in the study, into this eight-month study. And this is the leaf production over time. Okay, and so these darker colors, these are all the, dis these are the dispersed, um, <coughs> excuse me, the higher density transplants. <coughs> and these ones that you see up on top here, these are the nine and 16 dispersed transplants. So... Do these, I want to see a raise of hands. How many say that this transplant arrangement reduces competition? And how many say this transplant that's doing the best maximizes facilitation? All right, so was the best performing arrangement those that reduce competition? Dispersed. All right, Mark's in, in the, with the program. We've got some. Okay, and a lot of confused, confused uh, audience members. All right, so I'm going to give you the answer here. Uh, we're, in, we're in confusion. So yes, these are ones, they're relatively far apart, but they're relatively high density too. So the ones you started out, they had the most leaves at the beginning of the experiment. They also are cooking. But essentially, these ones, they're in a bath of nutrients. And if they're far away from, from their neighbors, they're producing lots of leaves, okay? So... That's the take-home message from there. However, on the dune slope, this is the leaf production over the course of the summer. So what we found is, of course, this big stair step down. The leaf production overall was much lower. So if you transplant on the dune slope, there's not a whole, there's not great sort of performance of these transplants. And there's not a whole lot of effect of whether you clump or disperse the transplants in terms of leaf production. So counter to our hypothesis, clumping the plants together in this higher physically stressful environment really didn't help a whole lot, okay? All right. Are they normalized? You mean by their by their? Yeah, from the beginning of the experiment. So this is just the total leaf. So you can see at the beginning of the experiment th that they had more leaves cumulatively. Yeah. So we could have done it leaf production, and you'll still see an outperformance of these transplants. Um, they're probably closer to equivalency with these ones. But in terms of net success of the experiment, this is just sort of meant to show it. I'll show you a couple other um, results. One other thing, this black line, you might be wondering what that is in the middle of the experiment. That's where we hacked off the top of the plants, okay? Um, and so we thought we were going to just sort of harvest the experiment, and then we're curious what happened after that. And what's amazing is the sea oats after just a couple of weeks, re-sprouted from their root base, highly resilient to this disturbance. So you don't see essentially the leaf density drop way off and then come back up. They produce just as many leaves after one of these sort of disturbance events. And that's kind of regardless of which zone that you're in, you see a sort of a minor effect of, of um, essentially disturbing these plants. All right, so how about how big the dunes were that were formed by these various treatments? So essentially, I'm going to give you the sort of the, the net result. Um, what we found, so we measured the embryo dune formation, so essentially the volume of sand that accumulated around these plants. This is in a sea oat, but I had a, not a good picture to show you guys, but this is a big hummock of sand. You guys probably see that on the beach around some of these plants, right? So you can envision what that means. But what we found is that on a log-log scale, that the total number of leaves is linearly related to um, the volume of sand that's trapped. So essentially, these um, configurations, especially those that are on that front line of the dune, and this is where the sand burial stress is relatively lower. They're still the ones, so that's where the sand movement is relatively less. They're still the ones accumulating the most sand by the end of the experiment. Okay, and not a whole lot of effect. I don't have all of the treatments on this figure just for simplicity because it's a zillion points, but it basically tells you the same story. There's not a huge effect of whether they're clumped or, tr or sort of dispersed, but there's a major effective zone here um, where on the front line we're having much larger leaf production and that's related to how much sand gets trapped. So the take-home messages from this study are that you know, when physical stress is low, you're in that front line area where there's all this rack, the dispersed, dispersed tr plantings that do minimize competition are indeed outperforming those clumped arrays. So yes, um, in this kind of condition under low physical stress, you disperse the transplants and that agrees with what our predictions were. Um, 
However, on the higher stress slope, it's the, really the higher density arrays um, that, are in, that enhance some positive interactions. You know, they're, they're so, there's enough transplants in that relatively small area that there are positive feedbacks between them. Um, but what we think the main reason why these kind of high density transplants are really doing so well in these high stress zones is there's relatively high mortality. And so if you have a lot of them, you can afford to lose some and still maintain sort of your, your, the success of your restoration project. All right. So in a so context of sort of how we're going to do restoration in the future or how we might recommend that practitioners or um, uh, marine contractors who are out there building dunes is that there's a couple take-homes. Number one, restoration success is far higher on this front line than this, than the, um, than this slope. So we really pr uh, promote this idea that if you're going to invest all this effort in all these plants, put them out here because that's where they're all going to grow the best. And that's also where you're going to accumulate the most sand. That's really what we want to do, right? Is sort of get that sort of ecosystem naturally self-organizing and coming back. Um, and, uh, and actually, the traditional conventional approach of dispersing transplants, if you put them in this location, works quite well, okay? All right. So it's not necessarily bad that they're evenly spaced, but we just need to put them in a different location. So another major thing that we, you know, have been inspired by in doing this experiment is what is really the value of this rack line in supporting dune recovery. And so I just wanted to give you a brief highlight of um, we're doing a, an experiment at Anastasia State Park. If you go out there and walk down the beach um, north, uh, if you go out from the pavilion, you'll see some of our plots that are there. But we established four by four meter plots, so they're pretty large in size, um, where after Hurricane Matthew, we went in and removed all the racks from the, this front line. And we've been monitoring how well the whole dune structure, the plant community, and the elevation of the dune has been recovering with and without rack. And we were really interested in this, not only because of how much plant debris ends up on these beaches after the storms, but also because in a lot of locations, beach management takes all this material away because beachgoers don't like to walk around all that dead plant material, that decomposing seagrass and, um, and macroalgae and things like that. Um, so we're curious about sort of future management implications, but essentially what we're finding from this experiment, these, this is a rack removal plot, and you see very low vegetation cover, a couple of little grasses that are left. This is a control where we left the rack in place, and I, you can't see it from this vantage point, but there's huge differences in elevation of these plots as well. So it suggests that essentially that this is a natural mechanism of dune recovery, and we should let the ecosystem leave it alone <laughs> and uh, let it sort of naturally recover because um, that, that initial zone is, is key for uh, natural development of these systems. All right, so I'm going to sort of take you back to the other side of the dune. So imagine you're at the, the top of the dune, and you're doing what you're not supposed to do and to, when walking on the dunes, but you're looking back on the salt marsh, right? Okay, so we're now thinking back on the backside of the intercoastal waterway uh, in the coastal wetlands and reefs that are there. So these, now we're going to sort of focus on salt marsh habitat and, and oyster reefs. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, this was a project that was inspired by conversations that I had with Nikki Dix. I don't know if she's here or not tonight. Um, but uh, she's a, the research coordinator at the Guanatalamato Matanzas National Estuarine Research Reserve. So many of you may be familiar with it. Part of the reserve is right behind us here. Um, and when I started as an assistant professor, I asked, what are one of the key management issues that you're facing within the GTM NUR? And Nikki uh, very quickly started to talk about boat traffic because the intercoastal waterway bisects the entire National Estuarine Research Reserve in this, in this region. And so I asked, okay, well, what are some of the issues with boats? And she said, there's just so many of them. And um, not surprisingly, you know, this is a reflection of sort of a larger global trend. Humans are everywhere, including on our waterways. Um, so there's really good data um, from sort of our coast, our, our oceans, about how ocean ship traffic is changing. And it's up about 300% in the last 15 years with the globalization of sort of our, all of our markets. And a lot of the d data that's currently available is on these large container ships and fishing, fishing vessels. Okay, so we know a little bit about what's going on in, in the oceans. However, we know far less about what's going on in our backyards. So small boat traffic is also on the rise. How many of you guys would agree with that statement? All right. 
And, um, but we're not monitoring it almost anywhere in the world. And we know very little about what the ecological effects of this persistent boat traffic might be on our coastal, not only the habitats that are there, but the wildlife as well. So a great place to study this is here in the intercoastal waterway. Um, just to give you a perspective, you know, we're one small part of what's a 3,000 mile long um, network of natural waterways and man-made channels. That's really valuable for being available to boats. It's an artery for commerce. It's, an ar it's a key place for recreation. This is how our boaters get around the coastal environment. And so this isn't a, a part of our, our ecosystem that we're going to take back for nature, right? Okay, this is, our, this is our highway along the coast. But unfortunately, a lot of the intercoastal waterway is bisecting what would otherwise be a really low energy environment. Our estuaries are naturally systems that experience just laminar flow, right? The tides come in and out of these systems, and now they're being constantly churned by this kind of this boat traffic. And in fact, the Army Corps of Engineers has just dredged out <laughs> the intercoastal waterway out of what would otherwise be natural tidal marsh and salt marsh channels, right? All right, so we're introducing boats into a system that normally has a shoreline that looks like this, where the lower inner tidal is colonized by these contiguous reefs of the inner eastern oyster, Chrysostria virginica. And on the backside, you have, you know, Spartina alterniflora. This is the key habitat forming, these are the key habitat forming species um, in temperate areas of our estuaries here. However, if you go out at low tide in the intercoastal waterway, this is what the shoreline looks like. You've lost all of that oyster reef and the salt marsh is retreating at a rate of about a meter a year. Okay, so if you guys, you know, pay attention to this, your shorelines are getting chewed away, and you multiply that by a 3,000 mile long, you know, intercoastal waterway, that's a lot of potential habitat that we're losing on an annual basis, right? Okay, so um, potentially to the boat track, but we don't really know the causation between boats and habitat loss, okay? So that science really hasn't been done. So we've been starting to study this and, um, and try to develop engineering solutions to, to mitigate it. And just to give you an idea of what the boat traffic kind of looks like from a hydrodynamic perspective, you can't see the axes here, don't worry about it. This is time. This is the, um, basically the water level. And these are all these little perturbations. This is, you know, from low tide to high tide being picked up by our instruments. And all these little blips are boats. And you can see that they're dramatically affecting water height, right, over time. There's some pretty extreme events. And if we count the number of boats, um, boat wakes that we record on the intercoastal waterway, um, this is around the week of Thanksgiving. So this is Thanksgiving Day in 2017. A maximum of 143 boats going up and down the intercoastal on a given day. Excuse me, <laughs> that was very loud. <laughs> Anybody's asleep, you're awake now. Um, but it's up to 180 boats in the summer. So this is a relatively mild period of time. Okay, so we're not talking about subtle traffic. So what can we do about it? Um, so I've collaborated with Nikki Dix and several partners at the University of Florida to develop essentially a potential solution in which we are putting up two lines of defense along these kind of eroding shorelines. The first is a semi-permeable um, break walls that are meant to sort of break up uh, wa boat wakes as they pro prograde on shore. And then behind them, we're trying to jumpstart oyster reef recovery using a couple of different materials. And the idea is that these are going to be stable substrates upon on which oyster larvae can settle and start to regrow oyster reefs where they historically existed in this ecosystem. And the idea is, can we stabilize the eroding salt marsh and can we regrow um, the oyster reefs and the oysters being the sort of second line of defense as they eventually kind of like um, develop. So we paired these living shoreline treatments with um, unmanipulated controls where we didn't have any living shoreline structures at five sites that varied in channel width. Um, and this was up in the northern part of the GTM NUR in Ponte Vedra. And we have about a year of monitoring data, and this is a little bit outdated. We're about two and a half years into post-treatment monitoring. And this is kind of what one of these structures look like. So each of one of our replicates has three of these break walls and um, with the oyster restoration structures behind them. And just to sort of point this out, you can see some of the sediment deposition occurring behind them. These are the sheen on the mud there. That's where the sediment is piling up behind these structures, suggesting that sediment's actually falling out of the water column and starting to accumulate behind these restoration structures, even though they're, they're like the ugliest things on the planet. We got this idea, though, from the Dutch, who I collaborate a lot with Dutch guys and, uh, and women, and they came over and said, I don't know why you're not building groins. We build them all over the Netherlands, and that's how we build salt marsh in really high-energy environments. 
So if you go anywhere along the Dutch Wadden Sea, the northern coast of the Netherlands, you'll see these groins, and it's how they've been doing land reclamation for hundreds of years. So they fill these brush-filled branch groins, this all natural materials, and what happens is that you have strong wind and wave and currents coming off the, the Wadden Sea, and you see sediment depositing and salt marsh forming behind these groins. So the idea is if it works in a sort of a wind wave driven situation, maybe it'll work where we have boat wakes. So are these break walls actually dissipating wakes and are they working? So we've been monitoring this um, using an array of sort of a cross shore array of um, hydrodynamic sensors where we have them um, positioned out in the channel and then an array of them um, as you sort of move on shore. So on the front side of the break walls and behind the break walls, and the idea is to measure sort of how fast the water is moving as well as how much sediment is getting kicked up. So you can use essentially um, uh, some acoustic backscatter measurements to assess how much sediment is getting sort of pulled up by wakes that are moving at different velocities and perturbing the water to different amounts. So the, um, this is a sort of a synthesis of what we found. And so on the x-axis here, we have what the depth um, of the water is just offshore of the breakwater. So you can imagine this is at like mid-tide. Um, so the tide is like halfway up, and this is at high tide. And on the y-axis, we have the wave flux transmission. So this is essentially the percent of energy that's coming in in an entire boat wake. So all those ridges and troughs, we summed up all the energy that's in that boat wake. We said how much of the energy that's being carried by that entire wake is getting reduced by the break wall. So we subtracted essentially the energy flux that was, um, we divided the the transmission is the flux that's onshore divided by the flux that's offshore. So what this is telling you, these are bend averages across um, about 10 centimeters of water depth. And what you can see is that um, essentially very little of the energy is getting through these break walls when the water level is relatively low. Um, however, at high tide, they're only dissipating about 30% of the energy. So about 70% of the energy that's carried in that, in that boat wake is still transmitted on shore when we have high tides. So essentially, this is when the breakwater that we built is, inter is interacting less in the water column with, the, with where the wakes are sort of propagating on shore. So vary varying performance, you know, depending on what the tidal height is. And we looked at sort of how much sediment is getting kicked up by these boat wakes. So what I'm going to show you up here in these upper columns, this is individual boat wakes. Uh, you can see the, you know, the wakes as they sort of propagate on shore. And here is the sediment, suspended sediment concentration. That's the panel underneath here. And you can see for some wakes, all wakes are different. Depending on fa how fast you're driving, how big the boats are, what the hull shape is, the wakes look really different. And what we are finding is that there's a lot of variability. Some of the boat wakes that are propagating on shore are kicking up a ton of sediment. Other ones, you see a little bit of sediment kicked up. And still other ones, it's like there wasn't a boat wake there at all, okay, in terms of how much sediment is getting moved from the bed up into the water column. And essentially, we're still working on analysis uh, with regards to this project. But this kind of the degree to which you have um, uh, a lot of, uh, sediment backscatter kind of in a lot of sediment getting pulled up has a lot to do with how fast the basically the bottom orbital velocity is. So how fast is the water moving at the bed? And so we're starting to um, get closer to identifying which one of the boat wakes. So which boats are really driving the fastest bottom orbital of velocities and which ones are kicking up the most sediment essentially. There's a lot more work to be done on that. A good sign, though, our oysters are growing behind these, um, these break walls, and so we're starting to see development of oyster reefs where they were otherwise blown to pieces by uh, boat wakes. So that's a sign that at least the level of energy dissipation that we've achieved with putting these structures out is enabling this habitat to regrow in this environment. And this is not good data, and I wish I had the most up-to-date um, sort of graph, but this is how much the edge has moved, and positive values means that it's prograding and moving back towards the channel. And we're starting to see at some of our sites some indication that behind the break walls, the rate of this progradation um, is faster behind the break walls than in our control plots. So the take-home messages from this sort of part of the talk are that these boat wakes, these boats are imposing essentially an artificial wave climate in our estuaries. 
and they're driving the loss of coastal ecosystems and all the ecosystem services that we care about habitats providing, improving water quality, carbon sequestration, fish habitat. We're losing all of that as we're losing the habitat. And I would argue that this might be the most damaging stress in some of our estuaries, especially in places that are experiencing the highest boat traffic, and we're not paying attention to it, and we're not managing it very well. Um, and so I think this requires a lot of a more concerted effort from the public, from the scientific community, to start addressing this as one of the key stressors affecting coastal ecosystems and managing it that way. Um, these semi-permeable break breakwalls, they can dissipate wakes. They are performing. Um, their, their level of performance depends on the, on the water level. Um, and they are stimulating oyster growth and habit, you know, marsh progradation. So we're seeing the benefits that we wanted them to achieve. However, um, in our environment that's really warm and there's lots of sort of... Um, shipworms in the water, <laughs> they are vulnerable to a natural biological stressor in this ecosystem. So we've done a bunch of other studies on shipworms, and, um, and so it may not be that, that you know, filling these structures with, with wood is going to be a long-term solution for Florida, um, but still the general principle of having something that dissipate boat wakes as they act on shore may be a way to provide sort of coexistence of boats and our coastal habitats that we care about. And so, yeah, I've already said that. So just a key plug for a new project that we have going on. We just deployed a camera that's now monitoring boat traffic on the intercoastal waterway all the time um, behind the, um, on the southern tip of um, where the Guana River interacts or intersects with the Talamato River. So this is a boat, and this resolution on this screen looks really terrible, but I promise it looks better on my screen. But what's really cool about this is that we're going to start cataloging the timing and the boater behavior of boaters in different types of boats, and also looking at where they might be interacting the most with wildlife in this ecosystem. So in this video footage, we can also capture dolphins and potentially manatees, certainly birds, um, and other wildlife. And so there's this potential to look at key times where there might be most uh, likely kind of interactions as well as better characterize the nature of this stress. So... Um, I'm just going to say just a few words about some of the work that I've done on oyster restoration and closing um, because I think this is uh, maybe the most important take home. So um, I got really interested in, in working on oyster reefs when I first started my faculty position because it's a, it's a coastal resource in Florida um, that's, that's very economically valuable. Um, some of you may have heard about the Apalachicola oyster sort of fishery. It's important here in local waters here in, um, in the St. Augustine area. Um, but this is an ecosystem that um, is historically degraded all around the world. But we've been a region where we have had actually relatively healthy oyster reefs, and that's changed a lot in the last 15 years partly because of uh, increased drought events and how that's interacting with harvest pressure uh, in our local waterways. And so when I thought about essentially habitats that I, I really wanted to work on to, to understand their natural mechanisms of recovery, I said, let's work on oyster reefs. And one of the major questions I had was, geez, there's people out doing oyster restoration all the time. How many of you have worked on sort of bagging shell? or participated. Okay, so we at least have some in this larger audience. You've participated in oyster restoration, and that is going on in coastal communities all over the eastern U.S., and it's been a, a community, like a restoration effort that we've really championed as a society and engaged a lot of um, people at different uh, ages and, and um, socioeconomic classes into restoring oysters. And so the question is, how far have we come in restoring this coastal ecosystem that we've put the most effort and investment in so far? So my student and I, we went out and we synthesized what was available in terms of all the restoration that had been reported in the literature. Um, and then we went to funding agencies that, that fund all these restoration projects. And we went to practitioners that we knew were out doing a lot of coastal restoration. And we said, give us all the records you have for what you've restored, what are the size of all the projects you've uh, implemented, what are the cost of those projects, and what were some of the materials that you used. And these are some of the you know, variety of different materials that are used for restoration. People are putting all all kinds of stuff out there to get oysters to grow. So it's kind of like a hodgepodge of, of type of effort. So does anybody have any guess of what percent of the of oyster habitat that we have historically lost might have be restored now after 50 years of effort of restoring oyster oysters? How, how many? Five or seven? Any other? 
Any other guesses? Yeah. 3%? All right. So it depends on what water body you're talking about. There's a lot of variability. Um, so, oh, I don't have the answer up there yet. Okay, so uh, stay tuned. All right, so this is over time. This is the total acre of oyster reef that has been constructed in different regions. So the total is on the top. Uh, the Gulf Coast is leading. Um, they've restored about 60% of all the oysters that have gone on. Um, Chesapeake Bay is a close, or is a, is a second. And then you don't even see what's going on in the southeast, the northeast, and in the mid-Atlantic relative to these other regions. Trying very hard to get oysters going, but we haven't simply gotten a whole lot of acreage um, out there. We're doing relatively small-scale projects. When you go to the Chesapeake and the Gulf, this is where they have multi-million dollar projects. This has been a major effort on sort of um, basically supporting coastal fisheries there, a huge concerted effort. Uh, to restore in these different areas. but um, So they're the ones making the greatest gains. However, despite this escalating effort, especially in the Gulf and the Chesapeake, we've restored only 0.1 to at most 17% of historic reef area as of 2017. So these 17%, these are in our waterways where we've done the most effort. And, um, and so what I argue is that you know, we have a long way to go to get this habitat back to ecologically relevant levels, especially when you think about globally, much of the East Coast of the United States, oyster reefs are either functionally extinct now or in really poor condition. So it's not that we have decent oyster reef and we're not restoring them because they're in good shape. It's, that's, not the, that's not the reality. Um, and finally, when we did this cost analysis, we found that only in the half of the projects that have been implemented are cheap enough to actually even potentially have a positive return on investment in terms of ecosystem services that are provided by those habitats. So it's just too expensive right now, for the most part, to do oyster restoration, especially when you care about doing it on scale. So we need to make some major um, advancements in how we do restoration. And additionally, we've been heavily reliant on using oyster shell for doing all this restoration activity. Oysters themselves are scarce. It's a, it's a supply, it's a substrate we just don't have a whole lot of. So we need to change our mentality about how we're going to go do oyster restoration um, in the future. Instead of you know, just putting oysters on oysters, we need to think more creatively about that. So I think there's a need for essentially mass-produced, cheap-to-deploy, durable materials that are successful at, um, at growing oyster reefs. This is just one example. We've used these biodegradable elements that are um, made out of potato waste um, from Dutch potato chip factories. And uh, they grow oysters pretty well, and they're doing quite well at growing uh, mussels in the Dutch Wadden Sea. Um, but we also need to be trying out restoration at scales that are needed to generate ecosystem service benefits. We need to be making these big investments in restoration and trying things at larger scales where we're actually going to start to see benefits. So a great example of where this is going on is on the west coast of Florida. This is Lone Cabbage Reef that fringes um, the Suwannee River uh, discharge, uh, where the Suwannee River discharges into the Gulf of Mexico. And this is an eight-mile-long chain of intertidal oyster reefs that they've done restoration activities on. Um, and I think this is the scale at which we need to be thinking about managing our coastal environments. So just in closing, I'm going to say I think that um, hopefully you guys are all excited about restoration after this um, talk. There we need sustained effort, we, especially on the science side and on management and community activism. Um, but we also need to be thinking about cost efficiencies. When and where does it make sense to do restoration? We shouldn't be doing it on the slope of these dunes if what we really care about is growing lots of plants and building you know, three-dimensional habitat and regaining all the services that those habitats provide to wildlife and, you know, for nutrient cycling. You know, we need to change our mentality about how we, how we do restoration, and that's why I'm putting scientifically informed investment. Um, and also, you know, making a concerted effort to mitigate those stressors like boats that we can do something about that are really needed to maintain some of our coastal um, habitats. So with that, I'm going to say thank you so much to all my collaborators, especially all the students who did a lot of the work and had a whole lot of fun doing the projects um, and the, you know, where, the, where the money came from to support the research uh, is also super important. Um, and with that, I'll, um, I'd be happy to take any questions from, from you all. Um, 
and thank you for your attention. Oh, with regards to boat waves um, and the difference in the data that you collected, are you looking at the, the type of hulls, monohulled um, or single-hulled, multi-hulled boats? Are you looking at sailboats? Are you looking at motorized boats, hovercrafts? So those boat wake analysis are everything that, that throws a wake. So when I showed you the energy transmission, you know, that went through the break walls, that's everything that is essentially throwing a wake. So that is a summary of, you know, double hulls and, you know, basically every hull type, everything that was on the intercoastal waterway. Oops, you guys are not seeing what I'm seeing. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so these are, you know, a hundred and something wakes that we recorded in this these couple week window in, in November. Um, what's the really powerful part of the video monitoring that we're doing now is that we can identify what w boats they are and we have sensors in the water that are detecting what the wakes are. And the idea is that either we can just collect data on the boats or we can just to de take data from what's in the water and we can start to basically identify what the boats are from just the signatures, whether it's a double hull or a single hull, how many engines it has, for instance, uh, those kinds of things. The wakes are fascinating because their shapes are really different, the degree to which they dissipate, how long they last, and where energy is packed in them in terms of different components or frequency that so the wakes is all really different. So exciting area for research on it. Yeah. <laughs> Oyster restoration. The ICW from here to St. Augustine seems to be nothing but oyster shells. Why aren't we a prime location for one of your experiments on oyster restoration? Oh, um, well, I just haven't had the time or capacity to do a major experiment yet on this, but Todd is doing a lot of work like in this particular region on oyster restoration. So we're trying to get them going and basically in, in Ponte Vedra. But the, the idea is that... Um, some of like where I, you know, where my research intersects is really trying to identify the key mechanisms that can then be basically implemented at scale by the management community. So this is where this kind of communication between science and management. So the, these larger sort of restoration projects that sort of should, you know, hopefully be rolled out. The idea is that the fundamental science that Todd and myself and others that work on this can be translated to them and the larger scale implementation kind of goes... Uh, I'm, uh, you know, either through marine contractors or management, but I don't know if that's the really what you're asking. Not really, because what I'm getting at is if, if one of the things that's holding back oyster restoration is that it's so dependent upon oyster shells, why don't you go where there are oyster shells? Oh, to collect it all. Oh, yeah, you mean the big oyster rakes and things like that for, for doing oyster... Yeah, um, so the thing about the, so we have these big oyster rakes. Uh, you guys may notice them, these huge piles of shell, right, that are washed up on the intercoastal. We don't know, essentially there's a little contention right now about whether those would be places that would be good to harvest shell from, partly because they're armoring part of the intercoastal waterway from further erosion. They're slowly eroding back over the marsh that's behind them. You see them eating the marsh behind them. They're essentially rolling back. But they're also slowing down that erosional process by at forming a hard line of defense. And they're also providing habitat for, sh for nesting shorebirds, like oyster catchers as well. So essentially, there's a lot of hesitancy from the management community to start taking shell from those areas and using them for restoration in other areas, right? So um, essentially you don't want to create another problem by harvesting them out of the water. The, the efforts that are going on with the GTM NUR though of doing oyster recycling is amazing. They've got one of the most active oyster recycling centers in the state and they're outsourcing shell now to do restoration all over the place. So I'm not saying here at all that we shouldn't be using oyster shell. We should continue to put oyster shell back in the water as much as we can and sustain those kind of recycling efforts. But I just think in order for us to restore this habitat at the scales that are relevant to, to getting them back, um, we just don't have enough material. And so what's happening in other areas, we're going and harvesting fossilized oyster shell from inland and dragging it and hauling it on shore to do restoration. So I think I'm still not there, but with what you're asking. I, I can't understand why we're not the particular area where you want to do oyster restoration work because we've got the shells here. 
Yeah. Well, I think it is a totally relevant location for do, continuing to do restoration, and it is going on. Um, so, yeah. Um, but the yeah. So I think it's just a matter of sort of resources and personnel and things like that. And so I would say, um, especially through the aquatic preserves, uh, Scott Eastman and the and the Northeast Florida Aquatic Preserves and the GTM NUR, they're still very much championing oyster restoration. It just um, it's, it's, so it's happening in this region, um, and hopefully that can continue to be ramped up in the future. Yeah. So do you know, from the boat uh, wave action, do you know what the boat wave action is actually doing to cause the, the oyster beds to, 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 you know, to, to disintegrate? I yeah. mean, is it, is, it, is, it the, is it the waves themselves? Is it the sediment that the waves are actually churning up that, that are affecting the oysters? Or is it, a, is it the fact that the next generation of oysters don't, they can't find a way to attach themselves to the, to the, to the existing beds? So our hypothesis right now, and we're actually starting to work with um, folks who work on complex fluid dynamics, is that bow wakes are they're extremely forceful. So the forces that are getting carried by a boat wake are very different from even an oyster reef that's in a very high, like an area of high flow. The flows are very different naturally in an estuary. They flow very laminarly, right, like this. All of a sudden you had a boat wake and now the waves are doing this. And so oysters that are used to feeling this are now experiencing basically pressures down on them and we think that they're essentially destabilizing, you know, they form these kind of hummocks. And I think that it's basically oscillating these, these materials and that's, it, it's disrupting the natural flow regime that these, that these animals normally grow in. So I think it's the forces. Uh, yeah. One of the things I think I heard is that whenever, whenever there's a disturbance in the water, they, they just close up and they stop feeding. Mm -hmm. And if, I guess if there's enough of these events that cause the oysters to close up and stop feeding, do they actually sort of starve because of that? I mean, is that... No, I don't think it's so much that they're starving. I, I really think it's that they're, you know... Um, I mean, some of us get moved. If you were walking, if you're in the intertidal, uh, it, out, in the, out in the, on the edge of the intercoastal waterway, and one of these, you know, one, one meter waves hit you, you're gonna move. So an oyster is feeling that same thing too. And so I think they are just like physically getting rocked by these, by the boat wakes. And it's, the thing is, it's, it's not that they're experiencing one boat wake, it's that they're experiencing 180 a day, you know? And even if it's five events in one day that were a real sucker, you know? Chronically, that stress is just, it's infeasible. And now what's going on, you've lost all that structure of the old historic reef along the edge of the intercoastal waterway. There's nowhere stable for these organisms to attach to anymore. And so without basically intervention of putting some stable structure there and ahead of that structure, putting something that's gonna make the wave climate onshore amenable to, for them to be able to naturally grow. It's not so forceful that they're going to get sort of knocked off. I think it's the only way you're going to get oysters growing back on the intercoastal. So there's a knockoff event when these waves continually hit the oysters. They're getting dropped into the mud. And yeah, exactly. They're getting tumbled, and you see them tumbled back up into the marsh, and then they eventually get crushed and broken up, and that's where, where those oyster rakes form, those long white things. You see them from Google Earth. You see them from the road, you know, and certainly when you're driving around. That's the, the old living oyster reef that's got pounded to a pulp and re-sort of cycled again and again by boat wakes and rolled over. Um, so that's, you know, that's an indication of what was there. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am? Oh, oh, over yes, here. Yes. Uh in answer to this gentleman's question, I'm not associated with Whitney Labs, but I know that Jose Nunez yes. and several other people have been involved in oyster restoration for several years now. Yeah, thank you for mentioning area. that. There's an amazing oyster gardening program right, run right out of here in Whitney Lab, um, run by Jose Nunez, that's been engaging a lot of local citizens into growing oysters to support oyster restoration. Thank you very much for mentioning that. I, I, yeah, I blanked on that one, so you're exactly right. You know, on the uh, west coast in Oregon, they lost the uh, oyster reefs because the 
basically the native Indians love to summer on the beach and they love their oysters. Mm -hmm. And so there are mounds and mounds of, of oyster shells that they didn't put back into the, into the surf. And then if you go further north in Washington, the beds are good, but contaminated by creosol from, mm -hmm. the, from the, you know, the railroad industry. Then moving back here, we're still trying to recover from the different philosophies of the Ar Army Corps of Engineers. Back in the turn of the 20th century, it was for navigation. Mm -hmm. That was their whole purpose, was to have navigatable uh, uh, waterways. And then it, then it shifted with hurricanes in the 20s to water control. So dig ditches, mm -hmm. drain the Everglades, yeah. you know, let's uh, control Lake Okeechobee. So I think we're constantly ch being challenged how to let nature, in the, I like what you're doing, watch what it's doing and then follow it mm -hmm. and, and allow, it to, allow it to heal itself. I think you, we have to pay attention to essentially the, you know, part of it is understanding those natural processes, but also understanding what are the envelope of environmental conditions in which you can even get these systems to persist in anymore. So in the case of the boats, that energy climate, that artificial weight climate I'm talking about, it is no longer, that is not sustainable for you to even have these habitats there anymore. The first thing we need to do is get that within a range of, <laughs> within which you can get plants to grow and oysters to grow. So um, yeah, and then use these kind of self-organizing sort of principles to well, inform If you go up to the Bourne Canal off of Cape Cod, the current flow through there is tremendous, mm -hmm. and yet it is packed with mussels. Mm -hmm. Just pa and they they thrive, so it's not necessarily just. I mean, this is more constant. It's not this disruptive uh, type of uh, turbulence. Yeah, yeah. I think there's. Am I uh, missing something? But uh, I would have thought that uh, wave flux is also affected by nature. The winds we have, mm -hmm. we have quite significant winds here, and uh, surely the, uh, the beds of oysters are affected by that d sort of turbulence also. And if so, is it as significant as the 180 boats per day? So um, if you think about the estuaries that we have in this part of the world, um, from Basically, the Indian River Lagoon, um, and even north to like South Carolina. Well, the estuaries are different in Georgia and South Carolina. We have these long linear estuaries, right? That's naturally, they've been, of course, altered by the intercoastal waterway and the Army Corps of Engineers dredging and things like that. But there's a, not a long enough stretch of water over which significant fetch develops. So wind waves, we've done analysis on what the wind waves, the contribution is. And if you look back at the, the energy, sort of the wake profile of uh, what's going on in these estuaries, you don't even see the wind waves. Um, so this is just one day, but these are tiny little blips. That's the wind wave signature that we're picking up. And so there are certainly estuaries, especially in North Carolina, where there's big open bays and there's lots of wind fetch. And absolutely, those are locations where wind waves would be acting on, on oysters and potentially introducing this disruption. But those are also locations where a lot of the oyster reefs are subtidal and not sort of, basically, they're, they're not directly interacting necessarily with that wind wave profile. So the wind waves, waves serve to flush the oysters clean? Potentially in those locations, yeah, it may be important for sort of basically, you know, introducing food availability and things like that. But in our system, if you think about much of any of the sort of the channels in this region, the only one I can really think of where the, you would get sign maybe significant wave fetch would be the St. Augustine Inlet, um, right, where you have a big enough body of water where you're going to get significant uh, wave fetch accumulating. Yeah. Uh, with regards to what? With regards to their stress, rising 
Uh, certainly, and I think the, but the, absolutely, especially even air temperatures, these are intertidal oysters in our part of the world. We're in a very hot climate. Uh, that desiccation stress can be really severe for these animals. Um, and with climate change, the other major factor that's known in this area is the drought stress. So when we have these periods of very low freshwater input to these estuaries, you get really high production of pred predators. And the oysters not only are not growing well because the salinity is not great for them to sort of be reproductively, um, for the reproductive optimum or the growth optimum, but it's also really stressful. The predation pressure is very high. So you go around to the oyster reefs behind us during a drought period and they'll be full of conch and uh, they're just getting chewed up by predators that thrive under sort of more oceanic, oceanic conditions. So I would say probably in the short term, the bigger effect of climate change is not water temperature but is the salinity stress in terms of acute events that are affecting the reefs. But nature always surprises me, so who knows? We might have a heat wave next summer and it's colliding with the right other you know, dimension of physical stress in the environment or biological stress that temperature becomes super important. Yeah. Last question. Okay. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Sure. Uh, I wonder if another stressor uh, to the ICW habitat is um, petroleum products mm -hmm. um, emitted in exhaust from all these boats going up and down the intercoastal waterway. I totally agree. I think that these boats are not clean vessels. <laughs> uh, they're, they're like a car, you know, and we're not regulating that. We're not paying attention to it, you know? And so um, it, not until we get the numbers up there for what the value of these, you know, the boating is, and also what the potential environmental damage is, I think, do we get anywhere in that conversation? So um, I totally agree. We haven't gotten there yet. I think we're also seeing, you know, as you erode in terms of other contaminants that might be associated with these boats, these sediments that are now being kicked up and reintroduced into the intercoastal are materials that were buried probably 40, 60, 80, 100 years ago. That's a period of time of no environmental regulation in this country. And so we may be seeing basically reintroduction of contaminants in this system generated by this boating activity that was historically buried under a bunch of anoxic mud. And it's now being reintroduced to the environment, redistributed uh, through the water column. And so I think that's another thing in terms of impacts of boats on other basically water quality in general. Um, it's the direct impacts of what's coming out of them, but it's all the indirect impacts as well. So lots of exciting sort of new directions for work. Yeah. Dr. Angelini, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. All right, thanks. <laughs>